My name is Sarah Martin, and I'm from the Center for Effective Philanthropy. Thank you for joining us for the final event of CEP's 20th Anniversary Virtual Learning Series. We'd like to thank the generous sponsors of our virtual learning series. Our premier sponsor, the Walton Family Foundation, our distinguished sponsor, the Archstone Foundation, and our sponsors, New Hampshire Charitable Foundation, Jacob and Valeria Langloth Foundation, the MJ Murdoch Charitable Trust, Community Foundation of Greater New Haven, and the Elmina B. Sewell Foundation.
Hello everyone, my name is Alexandra Huynh and I'm the United States Youth Poet Laureate for 2021. I'm a proud Vietnamese American from Sacramento, California, and I'm currently a freshman at Stanford University. I want to send my greetings to you all for this event, CEP's final 20th anniversary learning session. Thank you for inviting me to set the table for your discussion today. For me, poetry is a way for us to collectively acknowledge the realities of the world we live in and together hope for a better world. The themes I explore in my work include the American immigrant experience, the importance of listening to youth voice, and the climate change crisis, to name a few. We all continue to experience the devastating effects of the pandemic, racial inequality, and climate change. Many of you are focused on these vital issues, and you've been working tirelessly to mend what is broken, restore what is lost, and bring new life to philanthropy. I hope my words today can spark both urgency and imagination regarding the interconnected nature of our communities and the work we do to make a more just world for all. Thank you, and I will now be performing a poem called It Does Not Matter Any Longer Where You Live. It does not matter any longer where you live. From news reports on the fires in California and the floods in Vietnam. One, they waited for the answers they didn't want to hear, but knew were reality. From my living room, I watch as tiny yellow men march into the worst darkness and pretend not to hear when they have names. Witness an unprecedented use of the word unprecedented. The state of California has swallowed Connecticut like fever, leaving behind a scorched footprint, the shape of neglect. There are streetlights in the forest now. The forest is a city with wildfire for veins and a steady churn of smog. Vehicles spill onto highways to escape the color of death, but even the lucky ones wake up to smudge sun and sepia. Classic Western. Villainize nature, defend your honor, reduce the brown people to accessory. This is the work of a century's suppression, of a creature that feeds on its own dead. When there is nothing left to breathe, you produce the opposite of oxygen. Don't need a crystal ball. Return the trees to their cradles. Burn the land clean of history. Seethe warning. Blaze insurrection. Do not slow. Do not slow. Let them see the inferno they created. Two. Local residents now live in a way that is prepared for natural disaster. In the country my mother loves, in its naked heart, coastlines unravel into starving hands, drawing anything with mass into wet embrace. Include the slippers, whose tattered pockets kept our feet from catching wind, and the plastic, collected to prove we exist. Include the caution tape, the bamboo, the dining tables, the books, the altars, the rice, the fields they grow in, the aoyai, the photos, and the children, who have now found mothers in this soft earth. They say it sounds like a bomb when the mountain that is not actually a mountain explodes and it weeps burials for the willowed bodies who watch water rise to fool their conscience, who recite Buddha's name until synonymous with mosquito hum, who hold real hands in the dark of electricity while millions of hummingbirds crash into sheet metal roof and herds of baby elephants swarm at the ankles, which, of course, the meteorologists will call rainfall and the parents will call temporary, will call Home, three. Their only desire was to be together in the hope they loved. The structures are empty now, either because the people fled or endured baptism by flame, flood. An elderly couple is found in the charcoal of their farm, a boy recognized under comic shop sludge. The men on the news say climate change is a hoax. I talk back, hold the objects they inhabit, Break them. Alexander Wen, thank you. 2021 National Youth Poet Laureate. It's really humbling to join you all now on screen. That was really moving. And what a powerful call for urgent action. I'm Naomi Ornstein. I'm Director of Research here at the Center for Effective Philanthropy. And I'm excited now to share key findings from our forthcoming research report together with my colleague, Ellie Buteau. 
CEP's Vice President of Research. As Phil noted in the session opening, calls for action and for change in funder practice are not new. Sector leaders have long asked funders to provide more unrestricted funding, to streamline processes, to listen to and trust grantees, and to pursue racial equity and racial justice. But there had been little evidence of change until the spring of 2020. In a series of reports that we at CEP released late last year, we found that many foundations were making many changes in their practice. And though this seemed promising, it was unclear whether or not those changes would last. And so this spring, we followed up on that study. We're so appreciative to the folks at the Ford Foundation for reaching out to us and initiating the study and to all the funders here on the slide for supporting this second phase of our research. More specifically for this study, we wanted to examine whether changes in funder practice were continuing. We sought to understand what changes are foundations making? How are they changing processes and the types of funding that they provide? How are they supporting their grantees and communities most affected by systemic inequities? And how are they advancing racial equity? We also sought to understand what changes do foundation leaders plan to continue post pandemic? To answer these questions, this spring, we collected survey and interview data from both foundation and nonprofit leaders. We surveyed more than 900 foundation leaders receiving almost 300 responses for a 31% response rate. That response rate is pretty similar to the response rate from our first study in the series and right on target for typical response rates that we receive for foundation CEO surveys. We also conducted 33 in-depth interviews with foundation leaders and 32 in-depth interviews with nonprofit leaders. Across responses to the survey questions, we don't see many differences by foundation size, type, or geography. The story really is at the overall aggregate level, and that's what we'll be sharing today. And sometimes in our research, we see disconnects between how funders describe their work and how nonprofits experience their foundation funders. That wasn't really the case for this study. Nonprofit leaders' experiences tended to align with the changes that foundation leaders themselves report having made. I want to now share the three key findings in this study. Our first finding is that foundation leaders say they are working differently, most frequently providing more unrestricted support and streamlining processes, changes that they say they will sustain. Our second finding is that even as foundation leaders acknowledge that they have much yet to do, they say that racial equity is a more explicit consideration in how they conduct their work, and many are modifying their practices as a result. Our third finding is that foundations that have boards with more racial diversity tended to adopt more practices to support grantees and the communities they serve. Nearly half of leaders say that their boards are their biggest impediment to their foundation's ability to advance racial equity. Let's dig into our first finding, that leaders say they are working differently and plan to sustain these changes. At the highest level, almost all foundation leaders reported working differently with grantees in 2020 and then in comparison to their pre-pandemic practice. 55% of foundation leaders said that they worked somewhat differently with grantees and 42% report working very differently. And when it comes to sustaining changes, last year foundation leaders themselves weren't so sure or clear about the extent to which that they would continue these changes into 2021. But when we fielded the survey in the spring, almost all leaders told us that they sustained at least some changes. 41% reported sustaining most changes and 21% reported sustaining all changes. In interviews, most leaders reported a shift in their mindset, particularly when it comes to their understanding of the role of race and racism relative to the problems that they seek to address, and also with regard to the importance of greater flexibility and responsiveness. Leaders said things like the quotes that are representative here on the slide that I'm going to share. 
One leader said, we are finally willing to articulate and call out racism as a fundamental root cause of the opportunity gap. You can't talk about closing the opportunity gap without talking explicitly about race. And another leader said, we asked ourselves, why are we doing this? Can't we rethink this and more efficiently better serve our nonprofits? So let's start um, with how funders are streamlining processes. 76% of foundation leaders said they made changes to their application process. And similarly, 76% reported making changes to reporting requirements, all to reduce the burden on grantees. Among these, as you can see here in these charts, most say that they plan to sustain at least some of these changes going forward. More than 30% plan to sustain most changes, and more than 20% plan to sustain all changes. In interviews, leaders described sharing and shared plans for how they plan to continue with simplified, shorter, more streamlined and flexible processes, such as accepting email, phone and video materials and documents created for other funders. They said things like this. We left the guts of our application and reporting diligence at the door. We said, let's take a red pen and see if we can't skim off 50% of the questions we're asking because we're probably not using it. And so far, so good. Another leader reflected, we have gone way too far in what we expect nonprofits to report on. At some point, we just have to trust them. Turning to unrestricted funding, 61% of foundation leaders reported that their foundation is providing a higher percentage of unrestricted grant dollars compared to their pre-pandemic giving levels. Of these, 65% said that they plan to continue these new higher levels in the future. Leaders described wanting to be more responsive to grantees' needs and said they have a greater awareness of the difficulty of nonprofit work and a deeper understanding of the importance of flexible funding and allowing nonprofits to do their best work. As one leader said, the board has a more visceral understanding of the challenges that our grantee partners and their constituencies contend with. As a result, the trustees better recognize the expertise and wisdom of those most affected by inequities and are more willing to direct grant dollars to them with fewer conditions attached. I do though wanna to quickly touch on what isn't changing much. Multi-year general operating support grants are the grants that nonprofit leaders see as most helpful. But here on the slide, you can see that fewer funders, 27%, said that they are providing more multi-year unrestricted support. Among these, about two thirds say that they plan to continue this, pro this practice going forward, but still almost one third remain undecided. All right, Ellie, I'm going to pass it over to you. Thank you, Naomi. Our second finding is that even as foundation leaders acknowledge they have much yet to do, most say that racial equity is a more explicit consideration in how they conduct their work, and many foundations are modifying their practices as a result. They've been changing how they identify applicants, providing more funding to organizations supporting Black and Latino communities, listening more intensively to grantees, funding systems change, and collaborating more. In grant making, many leaders have increasingly prioritized communities most affected by systemic inequities. 59% report making changes to how they identify prospective grantees, and 67% report changes to how they select grantees. Some leaders described exploring biases in their foundation processes and reducing barriers to access to funding by, for example, publicizing grant opportunities more broadly, or taking more intentional steps to reach out to organizations focused on addressing systemic inequities, especially those serving or led by people of color. Among these foundations that made changes to identifying and selecting grantees, more than 80% said they will sustain these changes. 41% of foundations reported having increased the percentage of grant dollars 
to organizations serving Black communities. 26% reported having increased the percentage of grant dollars to organizations serving Latino communities. About half of foundations said they are currently directing at least a moderate percentage of grant dollars, that's 25% or more of their grant dollars, to organizations serving Black or Latino communities. Fewer foundations reported that they increased the percentage of grant dollars to other communities affected by systemic inequities, for example, Native American communities and Asian American and Pacific Islander communities. Those that did tended to report that their giving to these communities is currently a small percentage of their grant dollars. About 80% of those we interviewed said they have been more focused on listening to grantees and communities, particularly those most affected by systemic inequities. With this deeper engagement, funders have felt more attuned to grantees' needs and cited stronger, more trusting relationships with grantees. More than 75% of interviewed leaders said that since 2020, their foundations have either begun or increased their support for systems change, policy, and advocacy efforts. They also described greater comfort in being more public and visible about their policy and advocacy efforts. Nearly 60% of foundation leaders interviewed referenced increased collaboration with other funders and government entities specifically to advance racial equity. And most of these leaders said they plan to continue these collaborative efforts going forward. Our third and final key finding is that foundations that have boards with more racial diversity tended to adopt more practices to support grantees in the communities they serve. Yet nearly half of leaders say that their boards are the biggest impediment to their foundation's ability to advance racial equity. Foundations with more racially diverse boards, defined here as those with at least 25% of board members who are people of color, were more likely to adopt practices to support grantees and the people and communities they serve. These foundations were more likely to change processes to reach more nonprofits serving communities most affected by systemic inequities, direct more funds to organizations serving communities of color, lower income communities, and undocumented immigrants, have approaches for determining whether an organization is led by individuals from the community or communities served, collect demographic information from grantee organizations, or have mechanisms for tracking the demographics of the communities they support. Foundation leaders said in interviews that they believe it's important for the board to reflect and understand the people and communities they serve and described greater board racial diversity as an important component of effectiveness. Yet many foundation boards lack racial diversity. 27% of boards represented in the survey have no board members of color. On 30% of boards, less than a quarter of members are people of color. Even as most interviewed leaders said that their boards are having more and deeper discussions about systemic racism and its connection to their foundation's work, the most frequent impediment foundation leaders reported facing when trying to address systemic racism is their boards. One leader said, as we have amped up our focus on black led, black serving organizations, some board members have had concerns that we've abandoned other communities. We haven't. We're trying to get people comfortable with the fact that it's not zero sum. Another leader, this one of a foundation whose board is comprised of all white family members said, the family has decided to keep the board as 100% family. That makes it difficult. It's a barrier. Our board members are of a certain generation and they're behind the zeitgeist in terms of progressive thinking. Well, that concludes our PowerPoint presentation of the research. But before we move into the panel discussion moderated by Hillary, I want to share some summary reflections. A year ago, foundation leaders were unsure of the extent to which they would continue with various changes they had implemented since the onset of the COVID-19 pandemic. Now, almost all foundation leaders have told us they plan to sustain at least some of the changes they've made and a sizable percentage plan to sustain most or all of those changes. 
And it's not just that foundations say they've made those changes. Nonprofits also report experiencing these changes in their work with foundations. And in my almost 20 years conducting research in this sector, I can say that I myself was surprised uh, and even somewhat skeptical as I looked at the data for this study. But we saw clear patterns emerge um, of change as we started to look at data across surveys and interviews and from both the foundations and nonprofits in this research. And we realized change is in fact happening on many fronts. Yet many of the leaders in this study would be quick to say that they still have much work to do. And of course, it's possible that even if the intent to sustain change is there now, it could fade over time. It's possible this period could be a blip rather than potentially the beginning of a long awaited and many would argue much overdue shift in the mindset of many foundation leaders. But with a focus on not just recognizing the need to, but actually starting to take action to address systemic inequities and a focus on what nonprofits truly need, foundations appear to be setting themselves up to be more effective institutions, supporting change that will benefit those who need it most and ultimately our society at large. Thank you, and I'd like to turn it to Hillary now. Thank you, Ellie and Naomi, um, and, and Ellie, especially for those really powerful words at the end. You know, if there ever were a time when the same, you know, foundations continuing the same old, same old uh, doesn't cut it, this is that time. And that's what we want to talk about today, which is really what will it take? Um, what is happening and what will it take? to sustain it. Um, as Ellie said, I'm Hillary Pennington. I'm so uh, from the Ford Foundation. And those of you who know me know that I'm very passionate on these subjects, um, mostly because I spent the majority of my career as the, uh, as the leader of a nonprofit organization. And I'm so grateful and excited to be in conversation with this panel today and with all of you. Uh, so just to let you know, we um, I have a couple of questions to get us started off. But with, C with CEP's help, I'm gonna be tracking the, uh, the chat and the questions that you all send in and I will try to integrate them as we go so that we, um, we get to hear from you as soon as possible and get your, your interests into the, and your questions into this conversation. But we're gonna start out with the same question to everyone um, on this panel, which is, how did your organization change um, during this last year and a half in your policies, your practices, the nature of your relationships with, with your grantees? And as importantly, tell us a little bit about what it took to make those changes. What were some of the barriers and complications you experienced? And so we are gonna start off and I'm gonna just go um, according to the order I see people on my, on my screen and, and let's start, uh, Crystal, with you. Thanks, Hillary. It's wonderful to be here with all of you. Um, and thank you, CEP, for inviting me to join in this conversation. Um, when I think about the changes that the Libra Foundation, which I lead, um, which is a family foundation, Nick and Susan Pritzker and their four adult kids. Um, when I think about the changes that we made in the last 18 months to two years, three words really come to mind. Um, urgency, increase, and uncomfortable. Um, we have really begun, I think, during, uh, you know, sort of launched by the uh, COVID crisis and then followed immediately after that by the murder of George Floyd and what we all watched happen collectively and the trauma that we all experienced to feel the urgency of now, right, as, as MLK referred to it, the fierce urgency of now, to recognize that so often in philanthropy, we think that the, the most uh, valued um, attribute is to be calm, moderate, and slow and methodical, um, when in fact our communities are asking us to actually be more urgently focused and to really meet them in the work that they're doing. 
We also heard from our grantees that they wanted us to increase the money, move more money more quickly. So that was the increase. And in fact, that call came from our grantees in 2019. So in December of 2019, before any of these things happened, our board made the decision to double our grant making from 25 million to 50 million. And the reason they did that is because that's what we were hearing from our grantees. They said, what's coming ahead for us? We are a country that is incredibly fractured um, and we are feeling a real depression in our communities. And we really recognize that 2020 is gonna be one of the most important years of all of our lives. And boy, weren't they prescient. So that was one of the things that we did was to dramatically increase our grant making. And then finally, being uncomfortable. Um, it's one thing to listen to what our grantees say after we have had consultants kind of clean it and make it palatable and, um, you know, tell us the things that we don't want to hear in a way that maybe we can hear it. Um, it's another thing to actually be engaged with our grantees, hearing them talk about work that they're doing that makes us uncomfortable, but not then pulling back and saying, ooh, that means we're gonna walk away. We're gonna say no. Um, we're okay with this, but not okay with that. But instead saying, actually, we're gonna be here for the long haul. We want a long-term, deep relationship in which we are learning from you about what you're doing, and you are hopefully also engaged with us in a two-way street. So that's kind of what I would say were the three key points, urgency, increasing, and uncomfortableness, are um, being willing to live in that, um, that has dramatically changed for us over the last 18 months to two years. Thank you, Crystal. And I, I want to turn to you, Donna, because as we were uh, as we were talking in the beginning, you also went right to relationships and the nature of the relationships that you have with your grantees. So tell us a little bit about what you all have changed, um, particular kinds of examples, and then um, what it took to be able to make those changes. Yeah, what was hard? You. Yeah, thank you. It, it was all hard. It's still hard, <laughs> Hillary, um, just thinking about it. But so just to, to level set a bit for, for the uh, audience is that I, I lead a state association. So we, in fact, are a nonprofit organization and we provide uh, services to nonprofits so they can do their best work. We really are geared towards creating a strong operating environment by providing resources that are funding in some cases, but also public policy and advocacy uh, for those organizations. So we changed because we have always seen ourselves just as I described it, but it became much more important for us to be more courageous and more bold. And, and what I mean by that is we're an intermediary of sorts. We're, we're between um, the foundations and nonprofits that are, are seeking to get funding. But in that space, we also needed funding. We also had a panic, right? Because we were also wondering what our fate was going to be and how would we be able to continue to help nonprofits. So with that, it was this sense of, how do we still stay in the lane of servant leadership, but be bold? How do we actually advocate for nonprofits who at the initially said that the foundation partners were not calling them back, that they were anxious and that they didn't know um, if they could actually call them and be honest with them to say, you know what, I'm not really sure if I am going to fare out this year, might I be able to change what you've given me for a program to have it switch towards operations instead? So we were having those conversations. We were bold to have those conversations um, for on behalf of nonprofits to foundation partners who are also our funders, right? And so um, it, it became very interesting. I also like to add too, because Crystal had some, uh, really noted something that also uh, that I just kind of reflected in the moment to say what changed was, I am um, the first woman to lead Michigan Nonprofit Association and the first um, black woman to lead uh, Michigan Nonprofit Association. And with that, I felt my blackness for the very first time in ways that I had not before. And what changed after the death of George Floyd is that everyone was making a statement. I think we all can re reflect and remember the statements that um, not only foundations and nonprofits, everyone wanted to make, corporations wanted to make a statement. And in that moment, we changed where it, there was this huge recognition of who I am by myself and by my staff and by my board that I actually made a statement on my own, separate from the organization for the very first time. We're always in lockstep, but it became this kind of recognition 
that as a black woman and as a black woman leader that I needed to be able to voice my thoughts and how I thought um, I should be able to show up in the world as a nonprofit leader, but then also as a human being. And so it became this huge recognition that this was a very human issue and that we needed to recognize all the players as human beings first, and that we needed to be able to connect um, all of our issues from a, from a very human perspective. And so I never thought of myself as a human service agency, if you will, or advocating in that, in that way, but I found myself actually really addressing my relationships from a more human perspective than perhaps a business perspective or even a transactional, dare I say that, perspective to one that was much more transformational, that were first time uh, conversations, bold conversations that I chose to have alongside with others, um, other intermediaries that were serving the state of Michigan. We actually, um, I have to say, we weren't bold initially. We were a little frightened. What, what are we gonna do here? We decided to coalesce around being bold together. And we had created for the first time ever a, a collective called Transforming Solidarity Collective. And this is all intermediaries who serve not only the state, but serve the city of Detroit in particular, who was really faring very, uh, a lot of difficulties um, during this time. So bold, courageous, and also understanding who we are as human beings is what changed for us in a way that I think for it will sustain. Well, it sounds like your own um, courage to be authentic in the ways that you were, was transformational itself, opened up a different kind of um, role and relationships for you. Um, so really appreciate that. And Bob, you, you lead yet a different um, kind of philanthropic organization. Tell us a little bit about you and the changes you all made and what made them easy or what made them hard. Yeah, thanks, Hillary. I, I'm gonna be a little bit more granular just because um, the, the onset of the pandemic fundamentally changed our approach to grant making and, and particularly our, our whole relationship with our donors and with our community. Um, we're a very large grant maker. Uh, our, we average something over $150 million a year in grants, but as a community foundation, most of that is donor directed. We don't have direct control over any of it. We do have um, significant grant programs of our own. And as I guess a lot of funders do, we, you, you tend to get a little complacent in the way you, you do business. So we've, we've been in a space, we've carved out a space for us, what we call nonprofit capacity building over the last 20 years. Um, it's where we, we try to strengthen and grow uh, our, our nonprofit community in Memphis in the Mid-South. Um, again, we've been doing it for 20 years. We use uh, very experienced community-based volunteer grant committees, which is a little bit different for, for a community foundation. And you know, we, we thought we knew how to do it. We've been doing it for a long time. Our grant processes traditionally before the pandemic usually lasted four or five months. So it's, it's a really slow process of, of taking applications, crunching them through, evaluating them and, and delivering dollars to the street. Um, all of that changed in March of 2020 when I got a call from our city and county government leaders who were seeing what was coming and knowing that even uh, all the, the government dollars alone couldn't solve everything. So they asked us to lead an effort to raise private dollars uh, in our community for pandemic response. And I gotta say, we had never been involved in any kind of public solicitation. I, as a lot of community foundations do, you know, our primary job is to serve our donors needs. Um, but we, and, and, I, and frankly, my first reaction was, I don't wanna do that, um, but we did. Um, and the first thing we did was put together a collaborative group to do that because we didn't want it to, to seem like a community foundation thing, it needed to be a community thing. So we put together a, 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 an important committee that included city and county government, it included our United Way, it included our, uh, the agency uh, in Memphis that, that manages uh, nonprofit capacity building itself. It's a, an intermediary that provides technical assistance and other um, help to nonprofits. Um, everything changed, you know, kind of at, at, off the top. So we, we put that committee together and we, we moved to um, making weekly grant. Well, first thing we had to do was raise money because we started with zero. Um, so, but the community responded very, very quickly with the, our donors, donors from the community, corporate and, and institutional funders from the community um, threw in dollars pretty early. So from the very first, uh, very beginning, 
Um, our grant committee was meeting every week. We were literally making grants every Friday afternoon. Um, so very, very quickly, not, none of this four month stuff uh, yep, again. Yep. Um, it was informed by uh, constant polling of the community and, and the agencies to see where community needs were. Uh, so it was constantly changing. It was, we were constantly adapting to where those dollars were going. Um, I, I, I've said that, um, for instance, just even in terms of delivering food, um, you know, we started with the big agencies. We have a very, very large, very strong food bank in Memphis in the Mid-South that covers actually the whole region. Um, we, we funneled a lot of dollars to them, but they were going through their traditional channels and we found pretty early on that there were big gaps uh, in their delivery uh, of food. So we had to, to reach out to agencies that we had, not only that we had never funded before, but we had never heard of before. So there were agencies, particularly in minority communities, particularly in immigrant communities, um, where we just didn't even know where the needs were and who the agencies were that, that were serving them, but we, we quickly found them. Um, we, we've, over the course of, of the pandemic, we have funded 17 separate funding initiatives. Some of them were just straight grant programs. Some of them were technical assistance programs. Um, so not, so not just grants. And we've also gotten involved as the survey said in advocacy. Um, the last thing I'll say is we were aware of needs that were not being served by any agencies. So in some cases we had to create our own, um, funding mechanisms. Uh, so early on, uh, early on, and then again, uh, around the holidays of 2020, um, there were pockets of workers that were deeply hurt by the pandemic, hospitality workers, mm -hmm. and also arts workers. Um, there was no way, there was no existing um, infrastructure for providing support directly to those individuals. So we actually stood up um, new programs with existing agencies uh, to actually get dollars into the hands of, of particularly hospitality and arts workers. So um, most of those things, uh, many of those things in terms of collapsing grant reviews. Uh, oh, you know, another thing that I, that I didn't mention is for the first time, we also uh, directly uh, created priorities for agencies serving communities of color and agencies led by, by uh, individuals of color. Uh, in our three primary grant rounds, um, 45%, 65%, and 52% of our grants went to agencies led by people of color, which is way higher than anything that, that we had done in the past. Um, a lot of these things are, are, are processes that we will be maintaining going forward in, in all of our grant making. So I, I, I think it was incredibly uh, informative uh, to us of you know, kind of the, the complacency that we've been that we're, we're really good grant makers, but then you, you really learn that you aren't necessarily serving the, the needs you really need to be serving. Those are um, such powerful and, uh, and inspiring examples, all of you. And I love those very particular stories about the impact you've made and, and just the pivots that you've made in, in a particular place, Bob. So let's talk a little bit about where you ended, which is what will it, what gets in our way? What, what will it take to sustain changes like this? And what gets in our way? And um, if you guys don't mind, let's talk about boards. You know, that those findings at the end of uh, the CEP data are so striking. So how do you bring your boards along in support of these kinds of practices? You know, especially in light of the data in the survey about the difference that the composition of the board makes. I would love to hear you each talk about um, how you have been working to bring your boards along in terms of racial equity uh, and grantee practices. And, um, you know, and, and Crystal, you started out by saying your board was like there before COVID even began. But tell us a little bit about your thoughts on this issue within your own institution and more broadly. What about boards? So, um, you know, because I know CEP well and I love all of you guys so much and the work that you do, I'm just gonna treat this like a family conversation to be totally honest, okay? So um, you know, this is, um, there are not many women who look like me um, who run family foundations. And part of that has to do with the fact that most families select people who they trust and who they have deep relationships with. And it is indicative of the society that we live in that for most of those families that are white, that are wealthy, they don't necessarily have relationships with African-Americans or other people of color. 
So I have to say that already by hiring me, the family that I work for demonstrated a willingness to break out of what their normal traditional comforts might have been to say there's a certain kind of work that we want to do and we want somebody with the kind of experience that can do it. So the family was already committed to human rights work. They knew that they wanted to professionalize their family foundation, which had been a little bit more like a kitchen table than like a board table. And, um, and so they brought in someone like me who's got about 30 years of experience in philanthropy. When I interviewed for the role, I said that if you are doing mostly work in the United States and you have a human rights focus, then you have to have a racial justice lens because race is the sorting hat in America. And so we have to be able to look at that. I also pushed the board around issues of being willing to let to push more authority down to the staff who had engaged in trust-based philanthropy with our grantee partners and to say to them, trust us to do things and then we will learn about them as we move along together. As opposed to saying, let us prove something to you up front, convince you of how right it is, in, you know, um, inextricably proof. And then so say, powerful. how do we move together? So that's one of the, I would say, those are some of the things that we have done, push the decision-making farther down. Um, trust in people who are not necessarily the same folks that we've always seen as partners and really be willing to say there is, you know, the great Latasha Brown from Black Voters Matter says, you know, race makes all institutions unjust. In, racism makes um, all institutions unjust. So we have to be willing to go to those critical root causes of many of the inequities and injustices that we see and be willing to tackle them head on. I, I, there's so much in what you just said. And I, I especially love and would love um, the, the others of you to address this as well, that you talked about taking a learner's mind you know, it, together learning together and not saying, let's wait until we have all the evidence and we can prove you without a, prove to you without a shadow of a doubt that changing our practices in these ways would be better. You said, let's just start doing it um, yeah. together in a way that's respectful and we'll learn together. And I think that is a, you've named one of the huge stumbling blocks in the mindsets that I think we and boards have about what it means to be strategic and accountable. And I see you nodding, Donna. I'm curious how this lands with you. And I'm sure you all as um, in the association do a, do a lot of work either with boards or on the issue of boards. Yeah, absolutely. And so, and thinking about our board, and I thank goodness um, that the work around diversity, equity, and inclusion and justice really started back in 2009. But uh, when I became president and CEO in, in 2013, and just thinking about the uh, the board structure as a, it was actually a barrier to us actually having very diverse um, members on our board. So just to share with you very quickly is that our bylaws had 23 permanent seats on our bylaws that were held by presidents of associations. And mm -hmm. as you might imagine, those are so presidents of associations were mm -hmm. white, male, right. older people centered in our capital. So we decidedly said, wait a sec, this will, we will never be able to, with this system in place, be able to have a diverse board in the first place. So we took a process led by the board. I supported the board in their process to actually have the opportunity to even have people um, that represented racial diversity and all aspects of diversity on our board. But that isn't enough. That is, that is a big piece, but it isn't enough because oftentimes people actually experience tokenism when they're on the on the actual yeah. board and yeah. they're not really even having the opportunity to be their full self. So we keep challenging ourselves over and over again, not just who's at the table, but what does it mean to belong at the table and what does it mean to be able to leverage their thought leadership? And so we have things to learn, but we're moving forward. But I will say that those that we serve in the nonprofit sector um, in Michigan, there were lots of stories of boards that were not diverse and that they were having knee jerk reactions to we have to let our CEO go because they're not a person of color. Wait a second. That's a very knee jerk reaction. That is not mitigating um, the issue that we're, that's at hand. And so we had lots of conversations around what does it mean to embrace um, and, and be an anti-racist organization and how might you work towards that? And how do you change behaviors and ultimately change hearts and minds around this? And that's the work 
and it, obviously it's never ending. So we're really uh, grateful and um, I feel it's certainly privileged to be able to work alongside a lot of nonprofit organization boards around how do they actually get to the place they really want to be um, and be smart and strategic about it. These are such great examples because what, what you are describing is really the deep work, right? It's it's not getting the, the one and only person of color on a board or even to lead an organization and then everybody else thinking that their work is that their work is done. I mean, and, and I love the imagining the kinds of conversations you must continue to have as you do this deeper work. And so Bob, curious to your thoughts about this question, boards and also this notion of how do we move them, move our boards towards deeper work on racial equity in every sense of that word. Well, I, I, we're fortunate to live in a community that is majority minority. Uh, so with these issues, and, and I also run a community-based board. So I get to, we get to create our board <clears throat> drawn from the community. So our board has been diverse, not always, but it has been diverse for 30 or 40 years. Um, but by the same token, boards don't necessarily, even if even a diverse board doesn't necessarily come to change very readily either. And I think that, but we've been on this journey for a while. Uh, we pitched three years ago, uh, long before the pandemic, we, we pitched um, for the first time using uh, an extra lens on our, even our donor advised fund grant making. We used to just make a grant to any, any 501c3 public uh, nonprofit. Um, we actually added the lens because there's a lot of nonprofits that have 501c3s that engage in hate, uh, in funding hate issues. Um, and we actually uh, used uh, the Southern Property Law Center's hate group list as a new um, filter for our, even our donor um, grant making starting about three years ago. So we started this conversation a long time ago. Um, and as I, it, we've been dragging our board through that. Um, I'll say one thing, and I, the very key to this is, is board leadership. Um, we've been very, very lucky on this journey um, to, for, for, for a two year period, my board chair was Terry Lee Freeman, who many of you may know, she's uh, former head of the Community Foundation of the National Capital Area in DC. And then she moved to Memphis to be uh, president of the uh, National Civil Rights Museum here in Memphis. She was my board chair as we were doing all these things and as we launched into the pandemic. So she, even she was a little slow to say, you know, some of these changes are, are, are not what community foundations should be doing, but if you, she was very quick to finally adopt them and then lead them. So I think that the fact that we had strong leadership um, up and down the board, um, that was the key. And I, I'll say even with our board, um, being if you, a snapshot of our board looks diverse, but that diversity runs to cultural and political views as well. Um, as we still had some yeah. very conservative people on our board who still resisted it. We had a, a board member who in September of 2020 said he had grown up in the Mississippi Delta and he was sure that there was no such thing as systemic racism which yeah. was actually a hard thing for the rest of the board to get over for, for the next few months. Well, I want to come leadership. Back, I want to come back to um, ideological diversity, especially in this incredibly polarized um, moment that we are in, in general in the society and increasingly in philanthropy itself. But uh, but uh, we are starting to get some questions in the chat, Bob, and one of them is for you, which is setting aside, you know, sort of your, your board, how do you work with your donors and your donor advised fund to help them become more aware, more flexible, more responsive, are you using the same kinds of practices or does it have to be different ones? Um, well, donor education is the key and information is the key. Um, we launched a new platform, uh, I guess, three or four years ago on uh, a community data system that, that um, donors can, can use to see you know, what's, what's going on in town. Everything from uh, poverty rates to home ownership rates to uh, educational attainment by census tract. Um, so that's part of it. Um, with our own voice, uh, we, we tried, with our own grant making, we tried to, to influence our donors as to what we think is important. And we back that up with a lot of donor education. Um, with the George Floyd uh, murder uh, and the, the nationwide reaction to that, one of the reactions to that was there were a couple um, large grants made to HBCUs around the country to support learning their 
we actually, um, our board stepped up and made a 40 million, set aside a $40 million uh, endowment for our HBCU, Lemoyne Owen College here in town. And it was really kind of a knee jerk reaction. I think it was saying that the, the, the world is crazy. The world is spinning off its, its axis, um, but we have this and we can do this and we can, we can do the right thing for our community. So it's, and it turned, I mean, there's, our board is not unanimous on, on all of those things. But, uh, well, you know, what I, I love about what each of you is saying, it's, it's a little bit like cognitive behavioral therapy, like sometimes you just have to do it. And as you do it, people change what they think and believe. And I think that we forget that, you know, too often in philanthropy. So I want to come back to these themes, but we have a question in the chat that is for you, Ellie, and it is um, along the sort of strand of, of um, skepticism. Uh, and that is, you know, uh, what about response bias? Like how widespread do you think these, the person wants to know, do we think you think these changes are beyond the people who responded to this survey? Yeah, response bias, it's a good one. In the report that we're releasing later this month, we, we've written a bit about our thoughts on response bias and the studies or limitations and strengths. And I'd say there's always some degree of bias in who chooses to respond to a survey or you know who chooses to say yes to be interviewed. Um, so we don't know the extent to which foundations that made more changes in 2020 were more likely to you know, want to complete the survey or be interviewed. Uh, we do know that foundations that signed the pledge, uh, which was a pledge that was started you know, by the Ford Foundation and also informed by trust-based philanthropy, um, respondents who were more likely to, who signed that pledge were more likely to respond to the survey. Um, however, they were not more likely in their responses to say that they're going to be continuing their changes. Huh. Um, into 2021 and beyond. Um, and, you know, when it comes to the interviews, it took us a longer period of time than usual to get the number of yeses that we needed to conduct interviews. And so we don't know if that's because foundations that hadn't made the same degree of change, you know, mm. you know, if they didn't want to speak about that, or if it was simply we were asking for more time for the conversations than we usually do. So we're we're not quite sure. But Likely there is some response bias um, in the study as I think there is pretty much in every study that we do conduct. Yeah, well, thank you for that. And, you know, holding that thought and coming back to these three really exceptional people and foundations that are represented on the screen on the panel, you know, what we are talking about is really deep work, right? A very, very deeply entrenched biases, ways of thinking in, in our sector about you know, what good looks like in terms of philanthropy and then in our society around issues of race and so much more. So how do you hold and make room for um, that journey? And especially when people do disagree deeply with each other. Uh, you know, Crystal, you have a family that has a very, it sounds as if, have a very clear and well-defined set of values. So I wanna hold you for the last. But you know, Donna and Bob, you work in institutions where there is an there is a broad range, I imagine, of ideological um, diversity. How do you hold that space, and how do you help create um, room for people who disagree with each other to learn from each other and change each other? Maybe Donna, let's start with you. Sure. So, so for me, um, having the same kind of ideas and belief systems is not helpful when you're trying to, uh, to have a mission be attained. And so this notion of having these different perspectives is healthy. However, the guiding principles for us at the board as well as staff has, have always been our values. And so people find themselves to our organization um, because they care about it. So that's something that is very um, important to them. So we have this kind of common bond, if you will, about this is what we're trying to, to do. And the ways that we think about it are different, but we have to respect that. And so it shows up like what Bob said, it may not be a unanimous vote. And guess what? That's okay. That is okay. In fact, I would encourage that because we want people to show up as their authentic self so that we actually can have the best um, decisions and the best um, solutions for these things. So that's how we've been doing that. We've got um, opportunities to build consensus around themes, if you will, but decision making should not necessarily demonstrate that someone is not their authentic self there. And if it does, 
that we're holding each other accountable in terms of, um, of making certain that people do that. So we have a governance committee who does that and really engages with board members so they can show up as their authentic selves. But it also happens um, in our staff as well. And I know there are plenty of books in terms of how you can manage that, like Radical Candor is a way and approach and model that, that, that you can use. But we have a value of respect and how, we, how respect shows up is that people can speak their truth, their mind, their perspective. It is honored, it is accepted and listened to, and then decisions are made based, based on that. So we have heated conversations, um, but those conversations I find to be the ones that produce, I think the most advanced and progressive, if you will, um, solutions really um, to some of the things that we find are, are, are pretty challenging. So, so I encouraged it, I, I like that. And I think that is actually the best case scenario is that you have these different views. That that's the way forward to, to as you are saying, to, to better decisions and, and better work. Bob, what's been your experience? Yeah, Donna just used the one of the words that I was going to use, I, I, and that's respect. I think in, in talking with board members and donors who have a variety of, of political and, and social views that, that may be outside of where we're trying to drive um, the, the conversation, um, you have to talk to them, you have to listen to them, and you have to listen to them respectfully. Um, you don't have to agree with them, um, but you do have to listen to them and respect them. Interestingly, when we use the Southern Poverty Law Center uh, filter, we've, we've had several donors, a few donors, uh, make, try to make grants to people that are on that list. And I've talked to almost all of them. Um, somebody's talked to all of them. But uh, what they all say is well, they actually approve of the idea of a filter um, in general, but their groups are not hate groups. The groups that they're trying to support are not hate groups. So it's been an interesting conversation that um, as long as you're being, as, you, as long as you're listening and giving them a chance to talk, um, they, they tend to get there. And we haven't had any major problems as a result of, of that. So communication and, and respectful listening. I think this is super interesting because, you know, you think about a foundation like our foundation, we, we, you know, they're... Um, we have a great deal of diversity on our board. We have a very clear social justice mission. We we do not, we we are not because we're a national foundation caused to be in the kinds of conversations within our institution and even you know often in the spheres in which we work that the two of you are describing, and I think that that is a you know you can begin to see a national foundation a kind of um, drawing of lines uh, that we have to think about as a sector. Um, how to, how to change. Crystal, I would love to get your thoughts in here. Yes, thank you. Um, I think it really, it, it, I, uh, sometimes people look at the work of the Labor Foundation, they assume that this uh, board of family members are all exactly the same and cheering on every single thing we do. And, um, you know, it's, we have really robust conversations, discussions, and disagreements, just like any other board um, there is. So I think one of the things that we uh, try to do is strengthen our muscle around disagreement, um, strengthen our muscle around that uncomfortable conversation. Um, and we are looking to do the things that engage us in the most inclusive work that we can around racial justice work. So we are trying to push who is it that we consider the we, as opposed to who do we consider the other, right? So those are the kinds of levels of conversations we have. But the decision to double our grant making wasn't totally unanimous in that conversation. Um, but one of the other things that we have done is as a family, one of the real uh, values that I so appreciate about Nick and Susan is that when they think about their legacy, they think about their legacy, not in terms of their names on a building, or their names on you know, a particular project, but they think about it partly in terms of having uh, adult children who are um, exciting and interested and thoughtful and caring and committed. And so the legacy is not just in what do I say I did, but actually in the idea that 
that they are raising young people who are and have raised young people who um, believe in a set of values that are similar, if not exactly the same as their own. So that allows us to really try innovative things. It allows us to have um, you know, an effort like the Democracy Frontlines Fund, which we created, that really was not part of the strategy and the plan in 2019. And then in 2020, when the crisis hit, around George Floyd, we were really able to step up and say, let's innovate, let's pull other funders in, let's really try to create a pooled fund and do things differently. Um, and the whole family was excited about that, even though we didn't know what the end of that journey was gonna look like. So I think that's a really other important point. We're not all lockstep, but that allows us to innovate, to create a legacy of values, and to really look at inclusion and respect as both Donna and Bob said, for each other as individuals, but then the collective work as well. You know, I love, I, I love that. And I think in addition to the word respect, what comes to mind for me listening to all of you is just curiosity. You know, how can we be curious about what we don't know, uh, about who we don't know? Um, so I, there's a great question in the chat um, here. How can those of us who raise, so those of us who raise money from foundations give productive feedback to program officers, grants administrators, et cetera, when grant making and reporting changes are not consistently or well executed? How are those of you who are foundation executives tracking how well the changes in your institutions that you're talking about are being executed? Great, great question. Um, I'm going to give Donna a pass till the end because she can think about the groups of foundations she works with. And maybe, Crystal, let's go back and just start with you. We'll go to Bob and then to you, Donna. So I love this question. Um, and I think that we're actually entering a really different time in civil society where I think more and more nonprofits are being willing to step up and, um, and really challenge us in philanthropy about the practices that are not working. Um, you know, we all, uh, I think we probably all read Vuli um, and you may or may not just, you know, agree with him, but read him because he's raising really important issues that I think a lot of us have to consider. Um, I am also, uh, you know, I've heard of multiple cases recently of nonprofits that have refused grants from foundations um, because they felt that either the amount was disrespectful compared to other amounts that they're giving to different organizations, maybe um, disproportionately giving huge grants to white-led organizations and then giving these tiny little grants to BIPOC-led groups. Um, I think that there's more honesty, obviously, around CEP. It's why we use it, um, the uh, GPR, and being able to get those results. I don't know of a single foundation, certainly none that I've worked at, we've used the GPR forever, um, that have gotten the results they thought they were going to get. <laughs> so there is a real truth to that survey that gives you information that you can really activate on. And I think the other piece of this is being able to have real relationships with um, your grantees where they can be honest with your program staff. And then I think it's true that it also has to translate inside the organization that yes. the program staff can share the truth with the senior executive and that that executive shares that information with the board as well. It's delicate, but I believe more and more we are seeing nonprofits step up. I think they're doing it individually and they're also doing it collectively. And the foundations that continue to be respected, continue to be relevant and seen as leaders will be the ones that listen. Yes, and where they're and where they're and I think the the point in that question that ex, you know there's a difference between what we say and what we do, and how do we make sure that we know? Um, so Bob, what would you how where how would you come to that question, which is for those, for people who are raising money, who have negative experiences with our foundations, who do not experience us as um, uh, walking the talk, how are how do you track how well your changes and policies are being executed? Well, obviously we do evaluations like everybody does, and we 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 love getting that direct feedback, um, and we try to stay in touch with with the broader community. Although now uh, even Memphis is small, smaller than a lot of the places where you guys are. We have the, the nonprofit community is so huge that you know I couldn't possibly meet with everybody. 
But an important resource is developed here, and that is, I mentioned uh, Momentum Nonprofit Service Partners, which is the intermediary that we have. Um, and they provide training and technical assistance, but they've also turned into something of a union hall um, where uh, nonprofits can, can voice uh, opinions on, on all the funders, including us, and they can do it in a way that's, uh, that's anonymous so that Momentum can represent their interests back to the funders without attributing it to anybody and putting them in danger of being you know, blacklisted or, or whatever. Um, but that's actually been very helpful uh, and, and not least comfortable. It's a lot of it's been uncomfortable feedback, but it's been an interesting way to uh, an independent feedback loop uh, for, for our work and the work that the other funders have done. I mean, that independent feedback and the feedback loop, getting the feedback and acting on the feedback and showing that you have heard it is so important. Yeah. Donna, where would you um, come in? Sure. Sure. So I appreciate Bob talking about Kevin Dean's wonderful leadership um, there. He does a fantastic job. And I would encourage uh, nonprofit organizations to recognize the power in numbers and the state associations allow that buffer and that cover to be able to speak truth to power without them individually being uh, to feel that, that uh, there's some consequences to their perspective. However, um, I will say um, that even with state associations, they're also funded by um, the foundation community as well in most cases. And so um, this notion for us, as I mentioned um, a while um, in our conversation, a while ago in our conversation is that we created a transforming uh, solidarity collective that was really these nonprofit intermediaries in Detroit and Metro Detroit, as well as state association, uh, our state association coming together to say, this is what we feel about how you are acting um, in, in this um, arrangement here. And we want, we want to change, we want all of us to change and how can we do that and having those conversations. And I will say, and I, I said earlier um, in our conversation in 2020 and 2021 as well has been the first time that I've had some really great, meaningful, authentic conversations with presidents of foundations. Why did that just happen in my 12 years of being at Michigan Nonprofit Association? I don't know the answer to that, right? And I'm gonna take some responsibility on my part for that, but there's also some shared responsibility um, for those leading foundations. I will say my experience personally, as well as organizations who have reached out um, to me uh, around their experience with foundations, it's not the program officers that they're having challenges with. In fact, the program officers, they're, they're idealistic. They pretty much feel the same way. They're on the same page as when they try to figure out how do I sell this up the channels to the program directors and then gets to, so there's, then it goes to the board. That's where the breakdown happens. And I think that as long as we can get the leaders. And so that's been, that's been curious for me. I'm still trying to process this, but a president of a foundation should really want to talk to a president of a state association. But for some reason, that's not considered equal. And why not? We're leaders. And, and so I not? think this notion of leadership and really, really, really being honest with ourselves saying, are we really trying to solve these challenges? What does it take? And Crystal said it as well as Bob in several different ways. Those are uncomfortable conversations. Those are innovative ways mm -hmm. to do it. And guess what? We've been trying to solve poverty for years and we can't say that we've done that, right? That's right. So let's look at doing something different. Doing something different means really, and, and um, I heard this, this is not my saying, but funding organizations, particularly BIPOC led organizations who are proximate, like you want them to win. We are right. funded like you want us to I lose. think that might be Vanessa Daniel, but uh, you know, yes, absolutely. Yeah, so uh, that's, I think that's where we are right now is that we need to have these conversations. I will, so one last thing, in Michigan, we're having these um, dialogues that we started to make sure that this momentum stays. So it is um, foundation leaders, as well as uh, nonprofit leaders of their organization, having these honest conversations, they're facilitated because they have to be. Right. And guess what? I don't ever want to hear when we're talking about grantees and grantors, we need our safe space. Guess what? Our communities are not, lead, are not in safe spaces, right? They are leading a hard life. Let's get over ourselves and let's create a space that we working, we're working together and getting things done. Oh, I love that. that is 
kind of a mic drop. <laughs> and we're really getting close to the end of time. So I'm going to let you each know that I want to do one last round because uh, we don't have a new question in the uh, in the chat. And just, you know, your parting shot, your parting thoughts, anything you didn't get to say that you want to say, and particularly around these issues that we're talking about, of how do we get ourselves uncomfortable enough and keep ourselves uncomfortable enough that we work towards real change. Um, but as you're thinking, I'll, I'll just say one um, small, very micro technique that we have been trying out at the Ford Foundation around this issue um, is we've tried to build a data dashboard that asks questions about um, the experience of our grantees. For, and we use it each year um, on a regular basis with every program team as management. So we're asking them, how many new, you know, how many new organizations did you fund this year? What percentage of the organizations that you funded are led by people of color? How many days does it take you to make a grant? How long are your grants? What percentage of your grants are core support and general support? And we have found that just the, the sheer repeating of the questions, the kinds of questions that show what we pay attention to has been hugely helpful. And taking a page out of CEP's book, we do it in a comparative way. So it's an interactive dashboard where everybody can see what the other teams are doing. And um, there's no right answer. But but ha but having the the conversation about those questions has been really helpful for us in closing the gap between our words and our actions, which is a work in progress for us for sure. So we're near the end. I want to give each of you a chance to just do a one la you know one last wrap final words, uh, particularly around this issue of how do we stay the course on the kinds of changes that we've just started to make when there is so much distance yet to go. And let's see, Donna, maybe I'll start with you. Um, if you want to just pick back up that mic you just dropped. Yeah. <laughs> Certainly. Thank you, Hillary. You know, one of the things you said is really one of the things I wanted to leave with, with the group is that we should all have our set of questions, right? We should all. So we've adopted five questions that we ask ourselves, equity, that are rooted in equity, that really helps to challenge us. And so these are our questions. We The questions might evolve, but the, the, the point is, is that we are, are flexing our muscles and building rather our muscles around what questions do we need to ask to be better and recognizing that the problems that we're trying to solve or in the opportunities that are that lay before us we have responsibility in making change for those realities to come to come to fruition. And so recognizing that and always holding that to be the truth, that we have responsibility to change ourselves to be able to make a difference and asking ourselves the tough questions and doing something about that will always end up in us advancing and moving forward. So. I love that. And I bet every single person in this audience wants to know your five questions. So maybe you'll share them at some point with CEP. Bob, what about you? Well, I, for one thing, we do a lot of the tracking that you talked about. We, we track who's, who's getting our grants and, and we, we look at it over time. But I think more than that is just creating the expectation of change. I think that with in the foundation field, it's pretty easy to get very comfortable with where you are. Um, staff members like to know that they're going to come in and do sort of the same thing they did yesterday. They don't really like to be surprised. And board members even more so. The board members want to come in and know that Everything's running smoothly. We're making grants the way we always have. Um, but I think that uh, I think that if you can get the board and the staff to get a mindset of change, that we can always do things better and you should expect change and not just during pandemics, you should expect change through time, all the time. Um, that, that, that makes a big difference. If you can get them out of that complacency, both staff and board out of that complacency and get them to, to always try to get better. Well, I love that because as Donna said, it's not as if we've solved the problems. <laughs> we have a lot to, to keep learning and to keep changing. Crystal, you get the last word. Well, I thank you so much. And I uh, just want to echo what you said, Hillary, about data and using data to continue to keep ourselves honest. Um, you know, we've joined the um, Donors of Color Climate Justice Pledge which is basically just saying to all climate funders, we're going to get to a place where at least 30% of our grants are going to BIPOC-led organizations. And it's really a way for us to hold each other accountable. So I think that by building in that kind of commitment to the data, to understanding it, by being in relationship to each other in ways that we hold each other accountable, because honestly, as the previous question suggested, it's really hard for nonprofits to hold us accountable. So we've got to look to each other to really do that. 
Um, I think also really um, being honest about the power differential and our assumptions about how change happens. So often in philanthropy, we fall into that problem um, where we want to give people what we want to give them. We don't want to give them what they want. <laughs> and so Absolutely. we've got to really listen to what it is that they're saying that they want so that we don't make the mistake of believing that our perspective is the actual clear and true one. Because the power that we have, the privilege that we have, really does narrow the lens through which we see the world. But we have this incredible possibility of being in partnership with communities on the ground. And that really opens the perspective up and allows us to be in real relationship. And I, I, I wanna say too, that sometimes when we talk about power, people feel like that means we're demanding that people give something up. One of the things that has been most incredible about talking to my board, talking to the other funders in the Democracy Frontlines Fund, that we find that the relationships that they have built with grantee partners is enlivening. It's the Ubuntu, right? It's, we, you know, I am because you are. It is this relationship of making America the America we all want to live in, where our kids have a more diverse friendship pool than we do, where there's not such you know, economic um, disparity. That's what we get to do. That's the, that's the way we get to move forward with really building change in this country. And it's exciting to think about doing that shoulder to shoulder, not from on high to down below. Thank you so much for that. And, and Ellie and Naomi and CEP, thank you for the, the, the survey work you did that led to this conversation, um, the way you framed it, the kinds of questions you asked. And I want to just again thank everyone who was part of this for the great questions that we got from all of you. And um, to the three of you, you are, this was a really inspiring and energizing. Um, conversation. And I hope we are all leaving uncomfortable and ready to get out there and do the work. Thank you all. And I think I you, <laughs> uh, pass it back to Grace to close us out or um, end the meeting. Thank you, everyone. And uh, please do fill out the post-conference survey. And thank you so much again to Hillary and each of the panelists. Um, we look forward to staying in touch. Bye-bye. Bye, all. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thanks, Thank you, everyone. Hillary. Great moment. Thank you. <laughs>